Uh, hello and welcome to this uh, panel session on data ownership and data rights. My name is Valentina Pavel and I'm a legal researcher at the Ada Lovelace Institute. We are a UK-based research and deliberative body working um, with the remit to ensure that data and AI work for people and society. And today I'm excited uh, to bring this conversation to you together with an excellent lineup of uh, speakers to discuss the future of uh, data governance and um, what's the path towards uh, achieving individual empowerment and agency over data. But um, before we start, I need to mention a few housekeeping rules. Uh, this session is going to be uh, recorded and will be available on the RightsCon platform. I uh, would be grateful if we have a lively and interactive um, session, so please um, add your questions in the chat box uh, on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, please feel free to add them uh, anytime throughout the session and our kind uh, technical moderator will, will uh, help me flag them up um, and uh, we'll, we'll turn to those, um, uh, you know, uh, when it's time. Um, and please, um, it would be helpful for me if you would uh, indicate at the beginning of your text uh, whether you want to address that question specifically to one of the speakers. Um, and I think the last thing is that this is an um, open discussion, um, so please feel free to, to share it with the outside world. And um, if you want to attribute um, any remarks, uh, please be kind and um, tag us with uh, our Twitter handle, uh, which is Ada Lovelace Inst, I-N-S-T. Um, and use the hashtag our data future. That's going to be super helpful to, for us to, to be able to follow this discussion. Um, okay, so now before introducing our speakers, I actually want to turn to you and I'd be very interested to see what's your uh, position on data ownership or data monetization if you already have one. And in a couple of um, in, in, in just a bit of time, you'll be prompted with the first question, uh, which asks you whether you're in favor of uh, data ownership. And the answer questions are yes, no, or it's complicated. Um, and we'll leave that on the screen for a few minutes. Um, and then uh, we'll turn to the second question, um, asking this time whether you're in favor of uh, data monetization. And there will be the same um, answer options, uh, yes, no, or it's complicated. Um, and I'm super excited to, to hear what's, um, you know, what are your thoughts. Uh, please already uh, add your questions uh, in the chat. Um, and uh, I just want to, to mention that um, these questions are important for us uh, because um, at the Ada Lovelace Institute, um, we're running a project called Rethinking Data, where we want to develop a positive vision for the future of data uh, governance. Um, and these uh, models that we're going to be discussing today, um, such as um, data property, data as labor, uh, data dividends, and, and data rights, um, are, are important for us to, to figure out uh, what's the best path uh, forward. And we want to clarify some myths around um, property rights for data um, or um, buying and selling data um, on data marketplaces. And we're going to hear arguments both for and, and against uh, such models. Um, and ultimately, we just want to understand together with you what's the best path uh, towards achieving um, individual and collective empowerment and um, how can we achieve um, agency and control over data. So um, before, um, before your questions come in, I'd actually like to... Uh, say a few words uh, about the speakers, um, um, and then um, see the poll results. So together with us, uh, we have uh, Martin Tisne, uh, Managing Director at uh, Luminate, 
Well, we have um, Brittany Kaiser, co-founder of uh, Own Your Data Foundation and founder of um, uh, Digital um, Asset Trade Association. Um, uh, this is um, uh, sorry about this. This is a non-for-profit uh, firm um, lobbying uh, legislation. Um, promoting a, a individual control of digital assets. Um, next, we have Elizabeth Reniris, um, a law and policy expert and fellow at Urban Client Center. Uh, Daniel Masigwa, policy analyst and researcher at uh, Chipesa, an ICT policy and consulting organization based in Uganda. And finally, Chris Lee, um, senior researcher at uh, TUI Consulting in, in Korea and uh, general manager at um, My Data Korea Hub. So thank you very much uh, to all of our speakers uh, for joining. And while, while I, I have a look at the, um, at the poll results, uh, please um, add, in your, in, add in your questions. Um, and then we we can uh, we can start a discussion. Okay, th this this uh, screenshot is very very tiny, so uh, and and I'm short sighted. I'm going to come very closer to the screen. Sorry if this is a bit uncomfortable. Um, I see. For the first question, are you in favor of data ownership? Um, uh, the majority of you asked is complicated, and uh, the same for the second question, or are you in favor of data monetization? So I guess that's, uh, that's, that's quite normal for a RightsCon, a RightsCon audience, and thank you very much for participating in, in this poll. And um, before your questions come in, I'll, um, I just want to turn to Martin and ask him uh, whether he can um, help us clarify what's this uh, concept of, of data ownership. What, what do you understand by, by data ownership, uh, Martin? Sure, thank you. Thanks, Valentina. Um, so, I mean, just to start, um, you know, with the goal that I have, which informs my thinking and, and necessarily biases it to a degree. So, my goal, our goal at Luminate, is how can individuals, groups, and society minimize the negative impacts of data-driven interventions and maximize the positives? So there's an individual perspective, which is how can I ensure that data maximizes my life chances, regardless of my background? There's a group-level perspective. How can I ensure that the group I'm part of at any given time, which is tricky, is positively impacted by data and automation? And there's a societal one. How can I ensure that data-driven interventions are not negatively impacting the society I live in and positive impact them where possible? So I think the argument around data ownership is politically very appealing because it can be explained in simple terms, right? It reduces the issue to one of personal control. And we've seen how politically effective the notion of personal control is. And this works on both sides of the political spectrum. A couple of months ago, um, AOC in the States tweeted out, they track you without your knowledge. They amass your personal data and sell it without your express consent. You don't own your data and you should. These are like politically very appealing terms. Um, and I also, I think it's important to put it in a US perspective where some of these debates are taking place, where from a US perspective, very different in continental Europe, ownership, especially property rights are seen as key to economic freedom. So I just want to caveat that so these discussions are also very culturally specific to the legal, political, and social background that we live in. But the issue is, I think, people really talk about different things when they talk about data ownership. So if you imagine a spectrum, on one extreme of the spectrum, you have what I might call the pure private ownership approaches, i.e., you should own your data, have the ability to sell it with minimal constraints and be the master of your own domain, sort of walled garden. Like, And then if you imagine the sliding scale, you slide the scale, and then it becomes less about you owning your data, but about getting together with other people, like-minded people or not, working out ways to have cooperative approaches towards data, pooling your data rights. And then if you push the scale a bit more to the other, to the further side of the spectrum, the opposite side of the spectrum, you have the perspective of data as a common public good. And so I think it's important 
that we should sort of flag which areas we're talking about. So for example, from my perspective, when it comes to pooling data rights by group and using different data stewardship structures to do that, which we can talk about, whether they're data cooperatives or data trusts, I, I'm excited about that. I think there's issues, but I think there's a real potential. My concern as, a, as an activist, as a you know, sort of concerned, you know, impacted individual in the field is with pure data ownership. So I think that, you know, what I've defined as pure data ownership, again, you know, like you owning your data, having the ability to sell it with minimal constraints, I think that's flawed and for four reasons. Um, the first one is because we're more impacted by other people's data than we are by data about us. Can't build a wall garden. The analytic assessment of groups impacts individuals. And if this is why I started with like the aim. If what you're looking for is control over how data will impact your life chances, that's not the answer. The second reason is I don't think it's appropriate to put that responsibility onto users, onto people. If you consider how we regulate other industries, think of safe water, we don't give parents a little pipette every time their kid opens up the tap and gets a drink of water and say, okay, make sure you check the water quality and that it's okay. Like there's a responsibility there that lies with government to regulate it. It can't just be pushed on to individuals. I think the third one is a fundamental concern around equality and inequality. The less valuable your data is, the more you're likely to suffer. And I worry that it'll reinforce the existing power dynamics, which are very skewed towards the powerful. And if we've learned anything in the field of AI automation and data over the past five years, it's the degree to which automation and, and, and AI to a degree um, really impact the most marginalized and vulnerable people in society the most. And then the last point is I worry about um, data ownership, the pure data ownership plays leading naturally to monetization and that the financial motive will create powerful interest groups that change the data infrastructure and skew it towards profit when we need it to skew towards the public good. So, I mean, I'm not naive. I realize that the data infrastructure at this point from a commercial perspective is highly skewed towards profit. And I think that like we shouldn't go further in that direction. If we've seen or learned anything from social media of the past 10 years, if that's anything to go by, that should be a, a salutary lesson for what happens when you let the financial motive wag the data dog. So that's my take. I think that again, not to uh, you know, not to end on a sort of negative note, when it comes to pooling people's rights over data, when it comes to the sort of collectivization of people's rights, of people's data rights, sorry, whether that's data cooperatives, data trust, which I'm very happy later to talk about in greater detail, or other stewardship mechanisms, I'm very excited about it. There, I also worry about the profit motive. We can go into more detail. Um, but overall, I think it's important to define what we're talking about when we're talking about data ownership. And for me, that spectrum helps. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, you touched upon some very interesting points, and um, I'd be happy to uh, pick back on, on some of the elements that, that you highlighted, uh, but also invite uh, the other speakers to, to share reflections on, on your uh, initial statement and, and see uh, what other arguments are there, um, uh, how can we explore these concepts and um, you know what? What are their their benefits and, and their their limitations? So, um, uh, Brittany, I'm going to to turn to you and thank you very much for kindly accepting our invitation. Um, I'm uh, going to uh, do the long introduction um, uh, of your bio again, um, just to to mention uh, to people um, your some of your current uh, initiatives. Uh, so Brittany is the co-founder co of uh, the Own Your Data Foundation, which focuses on digital literacy. And uh, she's the founder of a lobbying firm promoting legislation around individual control of their own digital assets. And I'll be super curious to, to find out more about this. Um, and uh, I'm sure you're probably more familiar with her from the Great Hack uh, documentary and, and the role she played at Cambridge Analytica as a business development director or the book she wrote called uh, Targeted. So, um, Brittany, please uh, share with us what, what would be your personal vision around uh, data ownership? Um, how does it uh, translate to your current uh, initiatives? Um, 
some of the problems that that uh, that you you saw on the ground and um, how do you want to, to speak to those and maybe some of the reflections uh, regarding uh, Martin's intervention? Absolutely. Thank you, Valentina. And thank you to the Ada Lovelace Institute as well as RightsCon uh, for hosting us today. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I think when we're talking about data ownership, first we need to think about what are the core components of data rights uh, that we're trying to achieve through data ownership. So first of all, uh, when we're talking about data rights, what we're what we're thinking about first is transparency. So, what data is being collected about us? Uh, who is collecting it? Where is it going to be held? And what is so? We go into the agency part, station, which is what type of opt-in do we have? What type of consent mechanisms do we have? to knowing where this data is going and what it's going to be used for and who is going to be using it. Uh, then once we have decided to opt in to our data being collected or not, uh, where we have the right to keep things private, then if our data is going to be monetized, do we have the right to have some of that monetization for ourselves? And I feel like these are some of the, the high level concepts that we're trying to achieve. And on the data ownership side, the reason why we talk about data ownership is because I feel like um, in the privacy space and the data protection space for so many years, we've talked about privacy as a human right. But then when we go and try to legally enforce this right, it becomes incredibly difficult. Now, in most legal every world, property is the most protected form of law. So if you have the right to your data like your property, then for instance, if someone was going to abuse it, you would have the right to legal recourse. And th the way that I like to describe this to people uh, in order to kind of you know land the plane or simplify it is if you were to think about your data like you were to think about other assets or property that you have, then the business model of how you could protect your data or how you could share it and earn value back from that asset that you produce is like the Airbnb model. So if your data is like your house and somebody wants to use your asset, they want to use your data, well on Airbnb, if someone wants to use your house, they tell you who they are, how long they wanna use your property for, how long they're going to be there, what they're going to use it for, and you agree on a price and get paid before you hand away the keys. And something, <laughs> you know, uh, then if it's abused in any type of way, if they damage it, then you have legal recourse and you can actually do something about that. Uh, and I think that that is, that is the most simple way that I can possibly describe what a future of data ownership looks like. Uh, now, in, in order to secure uh, data rights in general, but obviously also data ownership I really see it as a three-part conversation, which is one, um, education and awareness. You know, people really need to become more digitally literate. Uh, what I do at the Own Your Data Foundation is that I teach digital literacy. So uh, we concentrate on kids uh, and parents and teachers, but also now professionals teaching people what are their data rights, uh, what are basic cybersecurity protocols to protect yourself online. Uh, how can you become media literate? Use information or hack and phishing, uh, for example. Uh, how can you use emotional intelligence when you are communicating with other people on social media? Uh, how uh, can you rid yourself of uh, addictions to devices? How do you have a healthy, um, both physical and, and emotionally healthy a relationship with technology? These are some of the things that... Um, are so incredibly important. And for the past 10 years, a lot of the world's top think tanks and advocacy groups and ministries and departments of technology and innovation, and even some of you know, the, the more ethical big tech companies have helped put together uh, a, a series of indicator sets that actually now uh, are called DQ. So like IQ or EQ, it's a digital intelligence quotient. You can actually have a score of how much you understand about how to lead a, a successful and protected digital skills. And so I think education 
is one of the most important parts of being able to secure data rights. And I, I do think it's really important to, to uh, acknowledge what Martin said, which is, no, it shouldn't all be on us. You know, we shouldn't all have to be so digitally literate in order to protect ourselves. We need companies and governments to, to obey by certain laws and regulations that are, you know, have an ethical and moral grounding, right? So besides the digital literacy component or education, it's legislation and regulation. And I've spent the past many years working very closely with legislators and bringing them together with technologists so that legislators actually better comprehend how technology works and can therefore make laws that actually make sense that are implementable and that actually protect people's rights in a practical way. So besides ethical laws and regulations that are, that are enforceable, which is the most important part, they're enforceable, they actually connect with how technology works. Uh, the, the third is obviously ethical technology. We need technology in order to unfortunately solve the problems that technology has created. <laughs> so the only way that we can really secure data rights is if we have the backend systems that allow us to protect our data. Um, you know, for instance, a lot of the big data breaches that uh, you've heard about over the past few years, obviously, I, su I suppose most famously, the Cambridge Analytica uh, Facebook data breach um, that I, I suppose I'm most well known for, for whistleblowing on. Uh, the main problem was that there, there was no way to actually prove whether data had been deleted or where it was being held. Unless you go and do a forensic analysis of someone's database, the technology wasn't there to be able to say, okay, well, when the API, which was allowing over 40,000 developer partners on their platform to take people's data, even if they didn't consent to it. Um, it the technology allowed that to happen. And you couldn't tell whether the data had gone to whom, how long it was being held there, what it was being used for. But if we have technology with tracking and traceability and consent mechanisms into it, you know, a, a platform like Facebook would have been able to say, well, the developer should have access to this data for this period of time, and they can only use it for commercial purposes, not political purposes, et cetera, and so forth. So we, we need to think about what types of technology do we need to build in order to secure data rights? And you know, I, I sit on the board of over 10 different uh, companies that work on advanced forms of encryption, um, different data protection models and mechanisms, a lot of blockchain companies that use distributed ledger technology um, to hold and, and protect our assets and also different ways of smart contracting. So instead of writing a contract for a technology product, you sign a digital contract which self-executes. So if I only want to give access to my data for to a company for six months for commercial purposes, it means they wouldn't technically be able to use that data for anything else. And at the end of month number six, they no longer have access to my data anymore. So we don't have to spend years in court trying to argue about why they still had my data. They wouldn't have access to it anymore. So technology is going to solve a lot of the legal problems uh, that we have right now where it's so difficult to enforce data rights. So I, I think that's you know a, a, a high level overview. But, but what I wanted to also mention is that a lot of the legal work that I've done in terms of data ownership is really uh, becoming uh, quite significant in the United States. Uh, in Native Hawaiian, that was the first to pass a law that said, uh, your digital assets are your intangible personal property. So your digital assets are your property, meaning that you have rights to those assets. And if someone were to steal those assets from you or harm those assets in any type of way that you have that legal recourse, just like if they were to steal your car or damage your car. And this is the type of way that I like to get people thinking to really ideate about the protection of your personal information and how it, it could be considered akin to anything else that you see as really valuable in your life. In my opinion, it's much more valuable than these other physical objects uh, because of how personal it gets. But it's important to think about that. 
Now I, I was uh, okay. Uh, Brittany, uh, sorry, let me stop you there because we we have also a question on on value uh, mm -hmm. and what what would be the value of personal data if we do uh, attribute um, um, property rights to it. And uh, just to clarify, in this array of data rights, you would include property um, as uh, an additional right uh, alongside the, the right to access, to delete data, to correct it, to modify it, and to maybe uh, port it to somewhere else to, to, to move it to, from company to company. Um, and I, I agree with you that um, a technical infrastructure is uh, probably the, the missing element uh, at this point in order to be able to um, to, to create this, uh, this layer, this uh, infrastructure that would allow us to uh, meaningfully exercise all these rights. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure on, on the property side whether uh, having property rights actually creates this, this fence around data. Um, and I'm, I actually want to hear from uh, Elizabeth whether she sees this um, um, as, as possible. Um, Elizabeth um, uh, has a legal back background and uh, she's a policy expert focusing on data governance and the human rights implications of tech. And I, I'd really like uh, her to, to mention uh, a bit more about the, the legal context, the legislative initiatives in, in the US. Um, uh, she's a, a Berkman Klein uh, uh, Center um, and also um, a technology and human rights fellow at the CAR uh, Center for Human Rights. So Elizabeth, can I turn to you and ask you um, uh, what would be your vision around uh, property rights, uh, monetization, what are the pros and cons? Uh, how would you react to the first uh, speaker's intervention? And um, if you see this uh, actually working in practice, yeah, sure. Thanks, Valentina. And thanks again to Ada Lovelace for having us and for convening this excellent panel um, of distinguished speakers. Um, so I view this through a completely different lens, I would say. Um, I, the starting point for this conversation for me goes back to uh, Shoshana Zuboff's uh, very important point, right? That if we begin with the data, we've already lost. So for me, where this conversation goes off track is that we we start with the data. We start with what to do about data, how to characterize data, what to call data, who should own data. And I think fundamentally what we need to do is we need to take a step back and think about the precursor to what comes before that. So what are the rights that adhere and attach to us as people in this human experience, both individually, collectively, and at a societal level, separate and apart from what happens to our data? And I think when we start to go down the data conversation without doing that precursor step, without doing that initial analysis, we always end up either going in circles around the impossibility and the logistics around this. And you know, the prior speakers have already made points on that. Um, and we lose sight of the dignity dimension. And I think it's really, really important to take a step back and think about um, property perhaps through a different lens. So um, sometimes in this conversation, we conflate things that are property with having a property rights framework from a legal perspective. And I would argue that we all know there are different kinds of property. So sure, there's tangible and intangible. So we can treat this as, as intangible property. And then we end up in sort of an intellectual property IP framework. And we've seen already many instances of how um, inequitable, how difficult, and how complicated that framework is from an enforceability standpoint. So one of the arguments around data ownership is typically around enforceability. But if we look at even the most recent example of a copyright directive in Europe, and just the nightmare scenario of adjudicating uh, something like copyright uh, in, in the digital realm. Um, we, if we extrapolate that to all personal data and apply an IP lens, um, it just becomes even more unmanageable and fundamentally comes down to how good are your lawyers, right? <laughs> how deep are your pockets, um, which is really uh, a, an issue around equity and justice and fairness. But I think fundamentally it's the dignity issue. It's the fact that, you know, there are many things that we have outlawed um, the trade of. So, you know, blood, people, human organs, um, voting rights, right, endangered species. These are things that um, may be, uh, you know, uh, actual objects or things that exist in the, in the physical realm. And yet, you know, we outlaw uh, sort of the, the commodification, the, the markets in them for good public policy reasons. Um, and even things that aren't, you know, personal data is even more fundamental because it's not even separable 
So there's a separability question um, that, that's at play here where it's such a deep aspect of, of oneself, of one's human dignity, of one's identity, um, and, and this deep indicia of who we are and our own autonomous presence in the world. So, you know, when it's when something is so physically and conceptually inseparable from ourselves, um, it's really not even capable of being transferred to others, nor is it a fungible, commodifiable thing, right? My personal data, by definition, my personal data is personal to me and therefore uh, doesn't really meet the criteria. So I think we need to think about, you know, what types of limits we impose on markets. I, I again, echoing back uh, to Shoshana, I think we do need to ban, you know, the trade of, of human behavioral features. And again, when we focus on the data, what these companies do is they'll say, we don't sell your data, right? They wiggle around this. It's the same we've seen around the CCPA in California, you know, the, the, do not sell or sell. It's very easy to work your way out of this. But when you have sort of fundamental rights, now enforcement is a separate question. So we can all talk about, we can get into a conversation about, you know, the GDPR and the extent to which it's been effective and enforceable. But enforcement, you know, there are enforcement challenges across all bodies of law. But I think if we just give it up on that front, if we, or for example, you know, the, the idea of um, an Airbnb style arrangement was raised. I mean, if we think about the gig economy, we've seen how, <laughs> how catastrophic and how destructive that's been to communities, to societies, right, to people. How the gig economy has fundamentally undermined rights. It's, it's increased the disparity of, of wealth, of power, of resources. It's really driven the asymmetries there. And it hasn't actually had the democratizing function that it was, you know, painted as that it would have just as we hear the same discourse around, you know, data ownership sort of democratizing rights and, and opening up um, markets to people. So I think there are deeper reasons beyond the logistical challenges. There are certainly, you know, we all know that we're not going to get a fair deal, right? Because we can't assess the value of these things because fundamentally it's not about the data. It's about the fact that these platforms that have the data are complete completely opaque, right? So we're fully transparent. They're completely opaque. <laughs> there are deep asymmetries there. We'll never be able to negotiate these things fairly on an individual basis. The own your data, control your data as an individual is fundamentally a divide and conquer strategy. It pits us all against each other. And it means that we have no bargaining power in respect of these behemoths, right? That just feed off this stuff. So I, I'm deeply concerned about um, feeding into that dynamic again, which is basically what we've had all along, right? Google and Facebook made a commercial decision and they uh, enlisted very expensive lawyers, frankly, to commodify something that wasn't a commodity before and to create this legal fiction around it. And what we need to do is we need to dismantle the legal fiction, right? I, I always call for a law lash. It's just, a lot of this is you know, not really, it's not about the tech, it's about the legal architecture that supports these things. And so I'm really concerned about taking what's been a commercial practice and now adding this additional sort of rubber stamping um, from a law and policy perspective to say that this is the approach we want. What we know is, you know, this may impose a tax on the cost of doing business. This may make it more expensive for the platforms, but it's not going to fundamentally change people's experience. And it's also not going to stop any of the toxic practices that are destroying democracy, right? It's not going to um, fundamentally change the way they do business. So I think we need to go back to this is, not a, this is not a question about data. It may be a question uh, about other things and data, but if we just focus on the data, we lose sight of the whole thing. And, and also we need to remember that we do have dignity, that we can impose limits on markets, that we have done it before. Um, and that if we allow everything to come into the private sphere, we now have, we have a different experience of the world. We now, there's now a profit motive in our entire lived experience. And is that really where we wanna go? Right? We've, been, we've been living that for, for quite some time in the expansion of that. So um, I think we need to be really careful about the potential to expand it to, to all spheres of existence. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. So I, I think your, your message was, was loud and clear. And uh, to, to pick back on only uh, one of the excellent points uh, you, you touched upon, you're basically saying that there's no way we can um, attribute uh, monetary value to, to data. And uh, there's also a question for us uh, from the participants on uh, whether we can actually make this, this real. If we, if we make property rights uh, real and if, if we start selling data, um, what would be the, um, the actual value around it? And I know uh, Daniel um, has... Can I just uh, clarify something you just said? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so, uh, so on the point of valuing, so I think, I think this is an important distinction. I think we can value things that we don't um, 
we don't treat as commodities in the marketplace. So for example, in the environmental sphere, we do this all the time with things like clean water and clean air. We have non-market valuation. So that's to say we can still um, attach an economic um, judgment, but we don't actually take that step that would allow the sort of commodification that we're talking about. And I think that's an important distinction and an important pushback when people say, well, this is not realistic. Then we're basically saying this stuff doesn't have value. Well, sure, it has value, but it has non-market value. Okay, that, that, that's a fair point, and thanks for, for clarifying, Elizabeth. Um, and I wanted to, to turn to, to Daniel Mesupa, who is a policy analyst and researcher at uh, CHIPESA, an ICT policy and research organization in Kampala, Uganda. And uh, I know um, Daniel has been um, looking a little bit in this uh, price element, um, and I'm not sure if he wants to jump in on this question or whether uh, he would like to, to share um, what, what, what's his understanding about uh, the different data governance models, if there are any potential implications um, at national or, or regional level. Um, and uh, also it'd be very helpful if you could also answer some of uh, the participants' questions. For example, we have one on um, asking whether um, data ownership protects uh, those who are already highly vulnerable and uh, how does how would this work at, at global level because I think this is it, it's important to understand that there is no one size fits all solution and that uh, there are going to be um, particularities in different uh, global regions so Daniel uh, it'd be super helpful if you could share your your insights with us uh, all right uh, thank you very much, uh, Valentina. Thanks to the Ada Loveless Institute and uh, RightsCon and the impeccable panel I'm on. So I think I can kind of extend uh, very many thoughts on uh, the speakers, uh, but also delving in specifically on the pricing and the valuation issue. For starters, I think this is largely a seller's market, uh, specifically in Africa, where data infrastructures are limited. We find that a lot of the pricing or a lot of the valuation of the buy that take players. I'll give you an example. About 800 million uh, people in Sub-Saharan Africa are not connected to the internet. And Sub-Saharan Africa has a population of about 1.2 billion people. So Facebook comes and, you know, it's setting up all of these data infrastructures, uh, including fiber optic and the like, but also as a future kind of uh, move. Basically, they're looking at the future consideration that they may get from uh, the value of new users and new data. Therefore, uh, what I mean by seller's market is uh, these platforms, including Facebook and Google, basically uh, set the price and say that uh, the average revenue per user, for example, uh, for users in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, specifically in Uganda, it's $7 per annum. There is a way that uh, they, they pretty much have the power not only to negotiate, uh, but to you know set the prices and have them as written in stone. However, Sub-Saharan Africa, or overall, the Global South is at a position where we neither create these big tech platforms that amass so much data, but neither, but nor do we also have the uh, strong regulatory or legal frameworks akin to the GDPR, for example, in the EU. So if I'm to place this on some sort of pecking order, I would put it at rock bottom. Basically, there isn't... Um, you know, much recourse that, that very many governments have. And in fact, uh, uh, when I situate the conversation uh, uh, to extend Martin's points on ownership, even if I, we included data as labor or data as capital, where basically data as labor is uh, how much is paid for what you render, basically whether to produce or to collect this data, or data as capital, where you basically co collect rent as capital that uh, these two framings still collapse under their own weight if I situate them in Sub-Saharan Africa, mostly because of the, uh, of the limitations in, uh, in data infrastructure imaginaries. However, also, um, uh, uh, just broadly speaking, I think for, for, for them to stand, for example, in, say, in the, in the Global North, we find that even if there were like, really strict rules and strict guidelines, for example, saying that data can't be reused, or data can be used for a particular period of time, it can kind of set like rational or measured ways that, you know, data can be measured or valued or used or that in a way that kind of protects data rights. However, I would like to extend a term from blockchain, which is the Oracle problem. Basically, 
the Oracle problem assumes that, you know, in, in one database, like one huge database, there are a particular set of rules. But how do these uh, dispar disparate databases held by different platforms and companies talk to each other? So if there is not like a standardized or, you know, appropriate or rights enforcing methods, uh, a platform that basically enables them to communicate each other, it means that the only way this can happen is through platformizing reality, basically going beyond privacy. And for me, this is something that is very apparent in Africa. So there has been like some sort of leapfrogging, you know, Africa is emerging as the last frontier of capitalism, you know, uh, where uh, um, uh, uh, mobile telephony has leapfrogged uh, uh, landlines and the like. However, for me, what I noticed that is more apparent is a clash of visions now. We are moving towards more frontier technologies uh, that basically platformize reality. So in a sense, it's no longer a digital enclosure. In a sense that you know you have sensors and platforms taking all of this behavioral data, psychosocial data, all, all stuff related, and moving to more of operational enclosure. So an operational enclosure is basically where things move from just being data to being operationalized. So decisions are being made in real time on your data. And uh, good examples of these include facial recognition, um, include other biometric te technologies that are very uh, prominently being pushed for in Sub-Saharan Africa, not only by tech platforms uh, such as uh, Facebook and Google, but also you know Huawei, which is leading this charge uh, in about 12, 12 African countries, and also international development partners. So I know I kind of take this at a higher, like a superstructure, basically because there is not many apparent examples happening uh, from a very uh, legal or regulatory standpoint. However, it kind of shows you that um, where things are standing and moves you from, you know, what stands in as, as ownership of the data or what stands in as an operational format of data. So if uh, the government, for example, has facial recognition cameras. Even here in Kampala, they're there. Uh, do you own your face, or is your face basically an operative image? You know. So for me, it's there's a very strong there's a very strong case to make, and this is not to exonerate uh, private platforms or not to think that they're very important, but a way that governments here are prioritizing their interests in data governance. But then also in a way that private entities, specifically telecommunications companies that are really huge and very influ influential here, are acting as apparatus for, 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 for governments. And so there is this very close interrelation between different players that um, something I'll be, willing, I'll be happy to unpack, but I think I kind of laid the foundation for it. And um, yeah, I'll be happy for further questions. Thank, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, there was also a, a comment from uh, one of our uh, um, participants that mentioned exactly this point that the fact the fact that data is uh, relational, it's so uh, entangled with other people's data. So there's um, a very little way in in, in differentiating um, clearly between this is my data, this is your data, this is somebody else's data. So um, how 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 could possibly um, how how could a, a data as property model possibly work in uh, when we have um, when we have when we're dealing with this uh, this reality? And I'm happy you you touched on the um, on the technical um, aspects. And uh, it'd be great to to hear uh, from from Chris um, how. How do you see uh, technolo uh, technological advancements in relation in relation to these um, data governance models? Uh, I know you're involved with uh, My Data Global, um, and you've been also uh, working on this concept of uh, My Data Operator. Um, and it'd be great uh, to hear from you what what would be your reflections um, so far, and and how would you see this uh, this work in practice? Um, because I do feel we're missing um, a, a technical infrastructure, the backbone, in order to be able to exercise um, our current rights, uh, at least in, in Europe, the ones under the GDPR are, are quite uh, straightforward, but we lack the, the practical means to, to exercise that. So I'm wondering whether 
the my data um, um, operator model brings some uh, some clarity around that. Um, and happy to to hear your your reflections uh, from the other speakers' interventions. Okay, sure. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to take an approach um, from uh, the my data principles. Right? So I think before talking about rights, before talking about data, I think before talking about technology. We should think about what the principles should be um, in handling our pers personal data. And in my data, we have six different principles. And I think um, hearing what everyone has said so far, I think we can all agree that uh, human-centric control is necessary. I think we all also agree that the individual should have a single point of integration for their data where they can control it. I think we also uh, implicitly agreed that portability is also very important. I think transparency is also a given in, every, in everything that we've said. And I think uh, Daniel uh, just mentioned uh, a very important part about interoperability between platforms and databases. And that's, that's absolutely uh, very, very important. Um, and I think Brittany, about education and and technology and I think this has to do with individual empowerment and I think even if we give people tools to use if they don't know what they can do with it if they don't know what the value is if like it, it's like giving a supercomputer to to a child right they have the tools but if they don't know how to use it if they don't know how to extract the value from it then it's it's meaningless right so so education is absolutely key. I think that's that's probably got to be one of the first things that needs to be done. And I think I really, really strongly agree with what Elizabeth said about how data, there's really not a price that I can think of that could make any sense. Because the price that is on data right now is a price that's been determined by companies that are commercializing our data, right? But if you think about it, my data, my personal data, the person that it has the most value to is myself, right? I, using my data could enhance my life, my quality of life, my health could get better, right? I could have better habits, I could manage my time better, but these are not things that I think uh, companies like Google or Facebook really have in their in their agenda at heart. So I think what I would would propose is that we should first understand that our data is most valuable to ourselves. Right? We are the ones that need to take charge of our data, and in order to do this, I think a lot in a lot of cases there will need to be a widespread um, education given to the people and in addition to that we'll, we'll also need to have tools to use and the good news is uh, as valentina mentioned we have this concept now called my data operators right and what the operator does is it basically stands between the individual and organizations that are using or holding a person's data and make sure that the person is able to have a clear view on where their data is and and who's using it. Right? It, it also, I mean, there's there's several components that go into the my data operator, but I think one of the most important ones is that uh, you're able to manage your consent. Right? Permission management is part of it, and and it's uh, it, it's actually a component that's in pretty much every single my data operator today. Um, and I say my data operator today because just today there were 16 companies that were awarded the status of my data operator for 2020. And I think these 16 companies, I, I, I'm not one of them. I'm, I'm just here to talk about them, uh, to, to, to let you know that, that these companies are, are really trying to, to set a different standard for, for the world right now. And um, I think these uh, the the principles by which these companies are are operating are incredibly valuable and very very 
strong. Right? It, it, the principles that I mentioned, the six principles, human-centric control, individual as the center of data integration, individual empowerment, meaning education as well as tools, and I think also the eagerness to use your data, right? I think that that's very important. Like enthusiasm should be part of empowerment. Portability, transparency and accountability, and interoperability. So these are the six principles these my data operators are abiding by, right? So I think right now is a very good time, uh, uh, at least for the, the landscape that we see in, in my data global and um, I think that answers your question, uh, Valentina. Uh, I, I would like to add, though, that um, I'm I'm an American citizen, right? But I'm living in Korea, and right now in Korea, there's a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, in Korea, it's kind of different from the states. So here, large corporations are kind of seen as um, a way to enhance or or and strengthen a country's power in the, in the global stage, right? So there's really not that much um, talk about trying to like break up Samsung or LG, right? It, it's, uh, it makes sense to, to, to kind of help them grow. But, but the government has a lot of trust from the people to make sure that Samsung and LG are playing fair, right? So I think this is, uh, it, it's maybe um, uh, specific to Korea, but it works and, and, and in one week from today, uh, there's going to be a new law that's passed, and there's actually going to be a my data industry that's born, right? And and what what this will is it'll be a highly regulated industry, um, and uh, it's uh, following that there's also going to be um, public services that are offered to every citizen in Korea. Uh, people will be able to control all of their government issued certificates in one place. And then there's also health, uh, healthcare related services that are planned as well for next year. Right? So I think um, if you haven't been following the situation in Korea, I think it's something that will definitely be worthwhile looking into. Did uh, I answer everything? <laughs> uh, yes, yes, Chris, that, that was very, very comprehensive. And thank you very much for, <laughs> for pointing out this, these differences and these, uh, these approaches that um, seem not to work in, in all uh, global contexts. And um, uh, we have just a little bit uh, more time left. So I'm not going to rep repeat the, the poll questions because I already know the answer. I should have uh, added uh, an answer option saying it's double complicated. Um, I'm sure uh, this is the message that comes across uh, after, after our speaker's intervention. And there are some very interesting uh, remarks uh, and comments um, uh, from the participants, uh, which we uh, haven't touched upon, and they, they are on point. So, for example, uh, one mentions the fact that um, uh, we don't have any rights over aggregated or anonymized data and um, companies or players that have access to um, to, to infer information or to observe um, trends actually have a lot of power and it seems that we don't have the, the mechanisms to, to deal with that. Um, and so an anonymized and non-personal data are, are an entirely new uh, uh, set of challenges. Um, and there was um, maybe one particular question for, for Martin, uh, which was very interesting around um whether so basically if we if we if we say um um as your position is uh, martin that property rights may not be okay uh would this uh would we still have some sort of common property resource regime over governing data resources um do you have any um reflections on that whether this would be a model that might might bring us um, more agency and control over data. Thanks. I mean, briefly. I mean, to be clear, I, I'm not quite saying that property rights are not okay. I mean, I think that um, it is a question of rights. I think that the way that we consider data rights right now is overly individualized, and it's overly focused at the collection level rather than the point of use. 
I mean, Brittany, when when you started, when you started, um, you know, talking about data rights, is quite right. You know, currently when we talk about data rights, it means transparency, it means what data is being collected about us, it means the opt-in, what type of content mechanism. But the, the concern that I have is that you know our entire apparatus when it comes to data protection which is exemplified in GDPR and now replicated in other countries with the CCPA in California, India, other legislation and elsewhere, hasn't changed since the 70s. They're all rooted on the 1978 French data, data protection law, which enshrined the notion that people's personal data must be collected, processed fairly and lawfully for specified explicit and legitimate purposes and with the consent of the person themselves. And I think that's necessary but it's not sufficient. It hasn't caught up with the way technology works. And actually, I think it's going in somewhat opposite directions. As you know, technology firms have moved from analyzing individual behavior towards analyzing that of groups. It's about the networks, who you're most likely to be similar to in what given situation. It's A-B testing on a huge scale. So if you consider this, what becomes apparent is that you're much more impacted, as I mentioned, by data about other people than data about you. And it's less about data collection, and it's more about data, how data is used. But the laws are really much more, at this point, focused on creating that barrier at the point of collection. So I think that when it comes to collective rights, what I would call collective rights, um, which are much more focused on use, it's really a question of transparency, yes, but transparency of the source code, the data behind high-risk algorithms, publishing algorithmic impact assessments, not limiting transparency to significant decisions in the way GDPR does. And it's also about participation, right? Really involving the public in a discussion around what data should be used, what data shouldn't be. I completely agree with Elizabeth's comments. I thought they were fantastic and really well put. Um, you know, it's a question of dignity and these are societal decisions as to how we want this information to be used or not. And finally, I think that we need to seriously fund and empower accountability bodies in a serious way, including oversight bodies for sectoral laws like labor laws, criminal law, genetic law. And again, Elizabeth, to your points, I would hope that that would go some way towards dealing with those power imbalances that, that you and Shoshana Zubov talk about. Uh, thanks, Martin. Uh, Brittany or Elizabeth, do you have some immediate reactions to this? Very, very short, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll be very, very quick. Um, I just wanted to address uh, two things. Um, one is, you know, what are we trying to achieve on, on data ownership and data rights? You know, what I see is that data ownership has the ability to make data be the great equalizer. If we can all start earning money from our data, we have a very tangible possibility of everybody in the world or everyone with a device being able to feed themselves and their family every single day. You know, Mark Zuckerberg says that every quarter, each of our data is worth, you know, $17 to try to make us uninterested in it. Well, for the 2 billion people around the world that live on less than $2 a day, $17 a quarter is a pretty significant amount of value to be able to retain. And that's just the data that you are creating in Facebook. You know, I work with healthcare experts who are estimating if you have, you know, secure anonymized data from individuals for researchers, what that looks like. Some diabetes researchers came back to a colleague of mine and said, if we could access for six to eight weeks, the data of someone that qualifies for a diabetes study, not only are we going to be able to most likely be able to cure different types of diabetes, but this, that data is worth $28,000 to us. $28,000 for six to eight weeks of data. You know, the reason why most medicines don't work on women and minorities like me as well as they do on white men is because 18 to 35 year old young white men is the majority of the medical data set that pharmaceutical companies and medical researchers are doing. So access to data is not just for big corporations. It's for solving a lot of the world's greatest problems. And if we can solve all of these problems in terms of advanced predictive algorithms and research, while we're also solving the problems of securing our basic rights and hunger, that is the reason why I fight for data ownership. It's a way to actually give everyone human value from the time and attention that they are spending every single day that is just being stolen from them. You know, we look back in history. Uh, Brittany, sorry to, to stop you there. Uh, I think we, we already, we already heard that uh, 
um, there, there's also the, the counter argument that uh, data cannot be actually valued in terms of uh, monetary, um, uh, in terms of monetary value. Um, and I, I hope uh, you all had um, a, a roller coaster ride with us and, and our speakers on this concept of uh, data ownership and, and data monetization. Um, uh, we're going to, to stop in a few seconds. So um, let me thank you again for, for joining our session. And uh, thank you again to, to all of our speakers for the, the, the excellent points that, that you made. We're going to, to follow up with, uh, with the write-up um, after the session on, on adalovelaceinstitute.org. And uh, thank you very much for, for being here today.